we're in the holy day period of the day of Pentecost. Shavuot, that's what it's called in Hebrew, which means weeks. There's a whole religious group out there that takes their name after the special events that happened on this day. They're called the Pentecostal movement because on this day God sent his Holy Spirit and filled the 120 who were there and they all began to speak in tongues, in languages that actually people could understand when they came in a little bit later. And that's all in Acts chapter 2. Well, we're here for another holy day, May 31st, 2020, on a Sunday, on the first day of the week, Pentecost, Shavuot. And now we've come through Passover already. We've come through the Days of Unleavened Bread. We came through the Wave Sheaf Day, which was not a holy day, but certainly we remembered it as a, the day when Jesus Christ, when Yeshua had to be raised up to heaven to be accepted on our behalf. On our behalf. So much more about all that in a minute, but we've gone through all of that. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, and I'm the founder and host of Light on the Rock. Welcome. I'm wonderfully aided by my webmaster, Scott, and his wife, Brandy. And if they want to, they can post a picture of themselves. I hope they will. And then, of course, I also have my wife who will uh, take, set up the camera and set up the lights and everything for me. So, I, so the four of us basically do this for you. And uh, I thank them. I thank God that I have them. Anyway, turn to Leviticus 23 in verse 1 and 2. In our English Bibles, when we have a word called feast, uh, the feast of the Lord, uh, the word feast actually can come from either of two, um, either of two Hebrew words. One is hag, a uh, c h a g. Uh, they say hag samaya, uh, c h a g. It's not chag. It's hag uh, samaya or hag. That that just means a regular feast um, uh, with celebration, joyfulness. Uh, drinking, eating, having a good time. and But here in Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2, Jehovah the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of Jehovah, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Now, let's note a couple points right off the bat in the King James and New King James, at least certainly. It says, these are my fees, uh, Almighty God speaking. Uh, they are his days. They're not, as some people call them, the, the feast of the Jews. They're not holidays. They're holy days. And so, of course, the early believers, all of whom were Jewish uh, at the time in Acts 2, the beginning of the church, kept the feast of God. So in Acts 2, as we're coming up to the feast of Pentecost, just before that, in Acts 1, I believe in verse 8, uh, Yeshua had said, or the angel, you know, they were told, you stay here because you'll be filled with power from on high. I think Yeshua said that. And then in Acts 2, verses 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, had fully come. You see, there was always an argument whether you count from a certain date or from another certain date. And uh, so some of the Jews in those days and still today would have kept the Feast of Pentecost a few days earlier than others. So when it had fully come, it was later now, they were all with one accord in one place. They weren't having fights. They weren't at each other's throats. They, they weren't split up into factions. They were with one accord. They were working together. What a testimony of what we should be doing and having today. I remember giving a sermon on that about 15 years ago to a group of people about this very message of one accord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And when they were all, then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now later on in Acts 20 verse 16, we read that Paul skipped going, he was out traveling and he skipped stopping at Ephesus. He wanted to make sure that he was in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Why is that? Why is that? Because it was one of those feasts, the pilgrimage feast three times a year, uh, the P Passover and, uh, and then Pentecost. Uh, you know, Days of Unleavened Bread, then Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. 
So he wanted to be sure to be there. He wanted to keep it. Pentecost comes from the Greek word 50th. It was the 50th day of the 50-day count leading up to that particular holy day. In Hebrew, the word is Shavuot, which means weeks. We can also refer to Sabbath, as there are seven weeks or Sabbath, plus then the next day, uh, which takes you to the Feast of Weeks, another name for Pentecost, or Shavuot, as the Jews would call it. So the word feast, as used in our Bible, uh, translated feast, often is the word hag, which means a celebration, a holy time, a pinnacle of joy, as my friend Jeff put it. But there's another word for feast that I want to talk about today. And that word for feast is moed, M-O-E-D, or the plural will be moedim. And it meant an appointed time, an appointment, a divine appointment with God. Moedim in the plural, a feast. Now, it was first used in Genesis 1.14 when God said, I will set, God set lights in the sky, the sun, the moon, and so on, as they were to mark the appointed times, as the original Hebrew has it, to mark the Moedim. Our, our Bible translates that as seasons. So whenever we read Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2, in that particular place and many others, the word feast there is actually not hog. It's not a celebration with food and wine and drink and all that. It's, it means appointed time. It means a time where we have an appointment with God. The Holman uh, Apologetics Bible puts it this way. Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2 in the Holman Bible. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, these are my appointed times. These are my appointed times. Not just feasts. Hey, I'm making an appointment for you to come and see me. On a set date, the times of the Lord that you will, the times again, that you will proclaim as sacred assemblies or as holy convocations, as King James puts it. So sometimes Moed is translated as feast. Sometimes it's a designated time. I really suspect that many of the feast days, as we know them today and as the Israelites came to know them, I, I, would, I would suspect that many of those dates were already uh, big days, big dates in, the, in, their, in their history, in Israel's history. For example, uh, the birth of Isaac was going to be at a Moed, at a designated time, at this time next year. And at that time next year, sure enough, he was born. Genesis 18, 14. Maybe we could put these verses up so people can write them down. Genesis 21, verse 2, and Genesis 17, 21. Genesis 18, 14, 21, 2, and 17, 21. Anyway, that's an opinion anyway. I can't prove that. But So when our God sets an appointment, he does expect us to show up. Imagine, not, imagine being a no-show when God sets the appointment. And so it's very important that we are there for the Feast of Pentecost and all of God's holy days. So anyway, the early believers met on this day. Imagine what, what would have happened if they hadn't have met. The ones who were there in one accord received the Holy Spirit. Imagine if they hadn't kept that appointment. But besides being an appointment, a moed, it was also a sacred assembly, a holy convocation. Here again, the word in Hebrew is very interesting. Uh, we translate it in our Bibles as holy convocation, sacred assembly, a meeting. Uh, those are correct meetings, but the word mikra, M-I-Q-R-A, let's post that. Uh, that's Strong's number 7121. It means something called out, a public meeting. The act, the persons, or the place of a public meeting. Hear ye, hear ye, you know, and, and then an announcement. It also could mean a rehearsal. It can also mean a rehearsal. But what's a dress rehearsal? I know when we were in college, our different classes, the freshman class in a private college we went to, the freshmen, the sophomores, and so on, would all put on, they take their turns putting on some entertainment, dances and songs, and we decorate the gym. You wouldn't even recognize there was a gym by the time we were done with it. But we would practice and practice and practice who comes in when and what you wear and what you do. A dress rehearsal is like it's supposed to be on the night. And that's when they get out any final bugs and so on. Do you realize the holy days are kind of like a dress rehearsal? Kind of like a dress rehearsal. 
running through the plan of salvation so that when these things come near, we are very familiar and, and we're not caught off guard. The Feast of Jehovah are mikra, are, are, yes, assemblies, also rehearsals, dress rehearsals. And on each holy day, something significant was fulfilled. And the ones in the past, they would kill the Passover lamb. Exactly on Passover day was when Yeshua was killed as the Lamb of God. And then Israel left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread. And then, uh, and then on the uh, wave sheaf day, Yeshua was raised to heaven. At the very same time, the high priest was lifting up a, an omer. A, it says sheaf in the Bible. But it was a, a, a weight. It was a container full of barley, very fine barley. It wasn't sheaves that he was waving back and forth. It was, it was a container full of very fine barley. At the very moment the priest raised that up, would have been the very moment Yeshua went up to heaven to what to be accepted on our behalf and then on pentecost the holy spirit came but many other big big things happened on pentecost and i want to get into that in a minute i see pentecost as a transition feast there are many things that have already happened on pentecost but i also see it as a transition to the fall feast and the coming of yeshua and I'll talk much more about that later on in the sermon and especially in the sermon coming up after this one, God willing. But let's turn now to Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. Here God says to us seven, uh, three times in a year, your males shall appear before Yehovah your God in the place he chooses. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before Jehovah empty-handed. Every man shall give as he's able, according to the blessing of Jehovah your God. Which is so we come. So we come on these three times a year, uh, day, the days of unleavened bread, Pentecost, and also on um, uh, Feast of Tabernacles with holy day offerings. It doesn't say all seven holy days should do it. It says three times. Now, the three seasons or times reflect God's plan of salvation. So the spring Passover, days of unleavened bread, the wave sheaf day, I believe really fully point to Yeshua, absolutely to him. He is, now get this, he is also what the unleavened bread pictures. He, is, he said, I'm the bread that came from heaven. My, Moses didn't give you manna, God did. And he says, I'm that leaven, unleavened bread. He is the one who's sinless, unleavened, the entire spring holy day season. He's the wave sheaf, all focused on him, on Yeshua, on the Lamb, on the Messiah. So just as the Passover lamb was picked four days before it was sacrificed and offered, so Christ also was picked four days before he was sacrificed. A, a day is as a, th a thousand years is as a day to the Lord, we, we, we read. And so what happened is 4,000 years before he was actually sacrificed, he was already as good as dead, who was slain from the foundation of the world. It says in, in a few verses, but maybe put those up there. Um, and um, Yeshua the Word is our Passover. He is the perfect unleavened bread. Uh, the spring harvest pictures him 100%, I believe. Um, I really do feel, that because it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that we'll read later on, that each one in his own order, first Christ, the first fruits, and then we at his coming, and then all the rest. So I really, really think that um, the, the spring holy days primarily point to him, not, not to us so much. It's even in his resurrected life. It's in his perfect life that he lived, lived that he had to ascend to God the Father, and his perfect life was accepted he died for our sins. He lived for our salvation. And he had to be accepted on our behalf, it says in Leviticus 23. So when we're baptized, we're baptized into him. And we were crucified with him. We're baptized. We're buried with him. And we were resurrected with him, we're told, in Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. And now we're covered by his righteousness. Now, it doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. No, the proof that Yeshua lives in me and you, the proof 
is that our life is changing. Our life is obedient. Our life is the same kind of life that he would have lived if he, if, if, if he were you and if you were him. So in the same way, though, ancient Israel came out of Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread, but under the cover and the protection and the covering that God gave them in the cloud above, uh, which sometimes went ahead, sometimes was behind them if the Egyptians were chasing. He was always covering them. He was their life. He was their covering. In the same way, we look to the Son of God, but we also must come out of the world, just as they came out of Egypt. We must now claim we're no longer a part, have no allegiance to this world. Our allegiance is to the coming kingdom, to the kingdom of God. It, it's not just a coming kingdom. I don't know why. It's just a habit. I guess we've all said that. The kingdom of God always has been. It exists now, our Father in heaven. He's in heaven. There's a kingdom up there. It's always been. It's existing now, and it will exist. But that's where our allegiance now is too, to the kingdom of God. And now we're covered by him, his righteousness, and uh, uh, the Lord, our righteousness. You know, some verses talk about that. And you know about the verses where Paul say, I no longer live. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me through faith. So I no longer live, but the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. We're told to let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And we're told in Colossians 3.3, 3, for you died and your life is now hidden in Christ, in God. So, however, I still feel now that the days of unleavened bread cannot picture you and me fully because we're not unleavened. We are kind of, you know, when we take in Christ and we let him become our life, but as far as day by day de facto living, we still fail. We still have sins. And we don't even yet at this point in the plan, uh, days of unleavened bread, Passover before that, there's no Holy Spirit yet. And we certainly can't live a perfect life without the Holy Spirit. So I think the spring holy days really do, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ the first fruits, picture him. And, um, and, the, and the barley harvest, the first fruits of that. Exodus 23, verse 19. Exodus 23, verse 19, the first of the first fruits of your land. Now, the first of the first fruits is Christ. You shall bring into the house of Jehovah your God. And now let's read that. Let's go ahead and post it up there right now. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 24. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. He's the first of the first fruits. Because we're also called first fruits. But he's the first of that. He's the wave sheaf. Then the rest of the harvest could continue. The harvest of souls could not work without the wave sheaf being accepted and risen up first. He's the first fruits of those who've, who've died, who've fallen asleep. But since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Really get that. God is not trying to save and call everyone right now. If you think God is, God is miserably losing. Because the vast majority of the billions of people, the eight billion people on earth, the, even the ones who call themselves Christians, the vast majority are not living the Spirit-led life. They're simply not. But God is not now trying to call everybody and choose everybody. They're, they will be called and chosen later. You have the high, high calling of being among the very first to be invited in. God is not calling the the mighty and the great. He, he's just not. He's calling you and me and people like you and me. So anyway, um, uh, it's a high, high calling we have. The second wave of harvest is the Feast of First Fruits. You have the Days of Unleavened Bread and uh, the Wave Sheaf, the Barley, and then you come to uh, the second wave is the Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Same feast, different names. That's when the First Fruits come more fully into the picture. Don't forget that the first harvest talked about unleavened bread. Unleavened bread symbolizes purity and sinlessness. When we come to the Feast of First Fruits, they had these two loaves of leavened bread that they raised up. 
leavened bread. Leaven, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, pictures sin that spreads. And so uh, the Feast of Pentecost is not about unleavened bread. Now, unleavened bread was never allowed in, uh, in, in the temple or, or tabernacle at any other time except Pentecost. The showbread was unleavened. Any of the offerings and sacrifices that had any kind of grade, uh, th th no leavening was allowed, except on this day. Now go figure that out. And who are the first fruits? It says in James 1.18 that by his own choice he gave us new birth. This is the Hoff, uh, Holman Bible. He gave us new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits. So you and I would be the first fruits of his creatures. So God is not calling the great, the mighty, the noble, the rich, the wealthy, the barons of society. No, no, no. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 29 says, God has not called the great and the mighty and the noble, but he's called the weak of the world, the not so noble. So no man could boast. And so, you know, he's calling people who are looking for work. He's calling for truck drivers. He's calling, he's calling waitresses. He's calling people who work in offices. He's calling for the not so great. Okay, he's calling just oh, at the average guy mowing his lawn or whatever we're, whatever we're talking about here, you see. He's calling the average grandfa grandfather, grandmother, grandmother playing with her grandkids. He's not calling the great big tycoons of, of society. Paul refers many times to uh, the fact that we are the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation 14.4, in fact, it says that one first fruits of the Holy Spirit is Romans 8.23. Romans 14.4 talks about the 144,000 and that these are people who are the first fruits of God and the Lamb. But the first fruits of the wheat, which is what Pentecost is about, again, I want to say again, would not even begin to happen. The first fruits of, I mean, the remainder of the barley harvest couldn't start till the wave sheep was done. Any harvest couldn't happen until that wave sheep was done. And so Christ had to start the plan by going to heaven, being accepted by his Father on our behalf. We are accepted because of Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why I'm saying the, the spring harvest really does picture Christ and we fit in more in the Feast of first fruits, Pentecost. It's all about us and Christ working in us. When I say it's all about us, I, I'm saying that's where we figure in. The world will figure in in the third one, which we'll, I'll talk about. So Leviticus 23, 9 to 11, Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come to the land which I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. He shall wave that sheaf or omer before Jehovah to be accepted on your behalf. The Holman Bible says, so that you may be accepted. You get that? There's no other harvest. There's no you. There's no me. Unless Christ died and was resurrected and went to be accepted by his Father and our Father. Because of him. Leviticus 23 and verse 11 says, He went up there to be accepted on your behalf so that you may be accepted, as Holman says it. So we believe, uh, by the way, that um, when we read uh, in Leviticus 23, 15 and 16, that they were to count seven Sabbaths. The word there is Shabbat, is Sabbath. It's not referring to the first holy day. That's not referring to uh, day 15 of uh, Abib, the holy day. It's, it's referring to the weekly Sabbath that falls within the days of unleavened bread. And from that day, you start counting on the very next day. Uh, seven more Sabbaths plus a day. And that gives you 50 days. That's how we come to Pentecost, meaning 50th. Or weeks, the Feast of Weeks, because there's seven Sabbaths, seven weeks. So on Sunday, May 31st, 2020, uh, will be the Feast of Pentecost, which in Greek means 50th. Shavuot means weeks. Exodus 34, 22. Exodus 34, 22. You shall observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of wheat, of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. So that's the third one. So events that will happen to those being called now, the first fruits, rightfully belong to this day. 
I don't know why for years and years uh, we thought, we believed that the first resurrection would be in the fall holy days, which is not about the first fruits. And it's those who are being called now who are called the first fruits, who are the ones who are going to be resurrected first. They are the ones, Revelation 20, I think it's verse 6, that says, Blessed and holy are those in the, in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy. And I'll come back to that a lot more in, in the second part, in the, the, the sermon after this one. And uh, you'll see what I mean. I mean, uh, the resurrection, the marriage, it all happens here on Pentecost, as you'll see. Uh, the third harvest, remember you had the Feast of, of um, Unleavened Bread. And then you had the Feast of First Fruits, and then we're told you had the Feast of Ingathering, or the, the Fall uh, Feast of Tabernacles, where you had the great big harvest of all the fruits, the vegetables, grapes, um, the olives, all of this happening in the autumn. And uh, so this is the big, big harvest. And uh, uh, it, 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 but it, the Israelites didn't realize it, but it wasn't about the crops and the harvest, the physical harvest so much, but God was picturing people, that these crops and these vegetables pictured people. But this is the time in the fall that pictures the millennial time, which pictures the thousand year millennial reign of Messiah. That's not the entirety of the kingdom of God. It's being ruled by him, but it's still here on earth. And this is the time that we have the lion and the lamb, the little child leading them in Isaiah 11. Uh, swords being turned to pruning hooks and plowshares and all that. We're not learning war anymore. A beautiful, beautiful, peaceful, clean environment. That's all pictured by these fall, this fall feast, the millennial reign. So Christ returns, and I think it's very possible, uh, pretty soon now. And I don't mean in the next three or four or five or seven years, but pretty soon now. And he sets up that thousand-year millennial messianic reign, and all humanity is converted. All humanity has their hearts and minds opened to finally see the truth, to finally see the spiritual things, and to be called of God, to be given the Holy Spirit, to be cleansed and forgiven, and to live the right way. And uh, those who don't, well, they're going to be on the earth uh, when it's burned up and replaced by a new heaven and new earth. And Satan is put away forever at the end of all that thousand years. I think totally eliminated. Personally, I think he's gone forever. So anyway, uh, so the 50th day, Pentecost, that we're on now, is a very special day. And then the ones after that are, are the fall harvest ones. And that pictures all the people who have not uh, been converted yet, who will have their minds open. God will work with them. Um, by the way, 50 is a very special day. It's a number of jubilee. It's a number of freedom. 40 is the number of testing. I just think it's really interesting that in the year Christ died, which I believe was 30 AD, uh, 40 times 50 gives you 2,000 years exactly to 2030. I don't know if that's going to be a special date or not, but it just seems to me that 40 is the number of testing and 50 the number of, of jubilee could be an interesting date, 2030. We'll see. Now let's get back to Pentecost. I do want to give a part two on this. Uh, so in, in, in the, uh, on Pentecost, some of the biggest things that happened on this day, I, I was thinking of titling the sermon what it's all about, Pentecost. In the New Covenant, of course, what it's all about is that God started the New Covenant church on this day. He sent a bit of himself. He sent his spirit that came to reside inside 120 people, men and women, that were assembled. It was the giving of the Holy Spirit, part of God's very divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. Now, not just to a select few, like a few priests or judges or kings or prophets in the Old Testament here and there, but now thousands would receive the Holy Spirit on one day. 3,000 were given life right after the miracle of Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. Contrast that with 3,000 who died near the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament. So anyway, we're divine, we're partakers now, 2 Peter 1, 4, of his divine nature. Now God and Christ now come to reside in us, 
as I've been talking about in my series on holiness, John 14, 23, um, Yeshua says, my father and I want to come and reside in you. You know, if you have faith, if you believe, if you obey and love us, you know, we will come and reside in you. John 14, 23. So, Acts 2, God officially begins his larger spirit family by giving them a down payment of his Holy Spirit until someday that will come to the fullness and we're changed to spirit. We're changed from perishable and corruptible to incorruptible, sinless. At that point, be able to be sinless. And we shall see God as he is. Because we shall be like him. First John 3, verse 1 and 2 and 3. I give that passage a lot in a lot of sermons. We shall see God, for we shall be just like him. So we know the Pentecost picture is the giving of that earnest, that down payment. We're sealed now, in this life, right now, we're not waiting to be sealed. Those who have God's Spirit are already sealed by this Holy Spirit in the New Covenant. Some other big things about this day. So the first big thing I want to mention is the giving of the Holy Spirit that makes us a child of God, that gives us the divine nature, part of his very DNA, if you will, uh, that allows us to intercede with I mean, to, uh, yeah, to the Holy Spirit actually even prays with us for us and allows us entrance before God. I mean, I have a sermon out there. You might want to check it out. 22 things the Holy Spirit does for us. And it's a marvelous, marvelous gift God's given us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it was on, also on Pentecost, or very near it, I think it was on Pentecost, when God gave the Ten Commandments. He gave his law. He gave his Torah to Israel, how to live. And God wrote with his finger on not great big monument-sized stones. I mean, it says Moses could hold both of the tablets in one hand as he ran down the mountain. God said something's happening down there, you know, the gold calf. God wrote on both sides of it with his finger. That happened on today. Just as he gave his Holy Spirit in the New Covenant, in the Old Covenant, he gave his law. He gave his Ten Commandments. And to many Jews, this is the primary meaning of this day. And so for many of them, they'll stand up on the Feast of, uh, of uh, Pentecost and they will read through, as they all stand up as it's being read, all Ten Commandments or the, or the, uh, the, 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 the Ten Words, as they call it, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the giving of the Torah. And at the giving of the covenant, God did something else. God who spoke to them, we know now was Yeshua. He's the one who marries Israel, who now marries Israel on the day of atonement, on, on, on the, I keep saying atonement, on Pentecost. If I say atonement, I mean Pentecost, okay? In the Pentecost season, perhaps right on Pentecost, remember Yeshua himself gave a parable in Matthew 22, where he says, Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who arranged a marriage for his son. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who arranged a marriage for himself? No, for his son. And so the one who married Israel was Yehovah the Word. I've given many sermons where I explain how the, the title of the Lord or Yehovah, depending on context, can either mean God the Father or it has to sometimes mean the one we know as Yeshua, the Word. But anyway, he's the one who married Israel on this day, on Pentecost. It's a huge meaning, the wedding between God and Israel. Remember, God had to later on divorce Israel. And upon Yeshua's death, he was free to remarry. And Romans 7 says that. And this time he's going to marry Israel, that is a... Uh, an Israel of God that is composed of people from all nations who have been grafted back into the vine or the, uh, into the, you know, into the uh, uh, olive tree of, of Israel. And the converted saints will be the Israel of God, as it's called in Galatians 6.16, regardless of what nation you come out of now. They married God. 
And God said, will you? I mean, I, I should probably put all this in there, but uh, he asked them the question, will you now keep these laws and commandments? And they said, yes, we, we will. I do, you know, we will. And then right after that, he got the 70 elders plus Moses and Aaron and Aaron's two sons, uh, his two oldest sons, uh, perhaps Joshua. But anyway, at least 74 people were invited to have a supper with God. You can find that. I think it's in Exodus 25. And they sat down and it says, and they saw the God of Israel and they, they ate and drank with him. That probably was a type of celebration. They just married Israel and have just married God. And God had married Israel. On this day, marriage, wedding, giving of the law, the covenant, giving of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, in the Greek, the, uh, the name for uh, the earnest of the Holy Spirit is Arabon, A-R-R-A-B-O-N, Arabon. And the, uh, the word to this day in, in Greece if you go to Athens and you, 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 look, you, you ask them for an arabona, that's the Greek word for engagement ring. I checked it out while I was there years ago. I checked it out with a translator I was talking to again the other day. And she says, yeah, it's arabona. So anyway, the, um, a lot of times people will, will propose to somebody and then they get married on that engagement day. So this was actually in a way like an engagement day to uh, the New, new Covenant uh, brethren. Also, the book of Ruth is read out loud among Jewish circles today. Why? Because it was after the barley harvest and into this time of the year, the wheat, when Boaz, the redeemer, the Goel, was able to marry the Gentile wife, the Moabitess, Ruth, who had become Israelite in belief. Remember, she had said, uh, your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. And so the book of Ruth pictures the wedding between Boaz and Ruth come together. Boaz was a type of Christ, I believe, and Ruth was a type of the bride, the church, composed of Israelites and Gentiles. And so your people shall be my people. So the Moabitess becomes an Israelite in belief and in faith, a citizen of Israel, and your God shall be my God. And again, we have to come into Israel Remember, even the holy city in Jerusalem above has 12 gates. What are the 12 gates? The names of the 12 tribes. Everybody who comes into the holy city will be entering through Israel, spiritually speaking. Spiritual Israel, because we're now the Israel of God. And we're also told in Galatians 3.29 that anyone who has accepted Christ, who is now in Christ, no matter if you're Greek or, or, or Israelite, Gentile or free or slave or whatever you are, you are now in Christ and, a, and an, an heir of Abraham, an heir of Christ, an heir of Abraham, because, look it up in, uh, in uh, Galatians 3.29. So that also is done on, on this day, reading of the book of Ruth, because it pictures again what? A wedding, a marriage. I want you to really get that in preparation for my next sermon. Something else happened on this day. The high priest on this day would offer up two big loaves, about 15 inches wide and about 24 inches long, two of them. Leavened loaves. Mentioned earlier, leaven was never allowed normally, but these are leavened loaves. And uh, scripture does not explain why they were leavened or what, why there were two loaves and who they represent. It doesn't tell us. I believe because they were leavened and because it's we are the first fruits, we're not the unleavened bread of the spring. That's Christ. He's the bread from heaven. That doesn't picture us. What pictures us is these two loaves. These two, the leavened loaves are raised up high to God Almighty. So the house of God was composed of people who had been sinful, pictured by the leaven, who had repented, who had been accepted now by God, and uh, were leavened in that sense, but the leaven now has stopped. It's all done. Remember the house of God 
from Gentiles and all of us, was to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's what That was the intention of the temple. It was even built by a lot of Gentiles. Remember Hiram coming down to help build it? And, and the Phoenicians and the people from up north, uh, they came down to help, who were Gentiles, I mean. And even Christ, even David, had Gentile blood in them. You don't hear that said a lot, but they did. They had the blood of Rahab the harlot in their DNA. They had the bloodlines of uh, Ruth the Moabitess in their bloodlines. So Rahab the Canaanite harlot as well, like I said. But it's how we end up that counts. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what they were in the past or what I was in the past or what you are in the past or were in the past. What matters is how we end up. There's so many verses that say that. God's not going to remember the past if we accept Christ as our Savior and move on and change and turn from our wicked way. He will hear us and hear our prayers. Now these two loaves, again, 24 by 15 inches, the grain was not threshed the common way, but were, the stalks and grains were uh, hand rubbed and then smashed or beaten by hand and then sifted through num numerous siftings until they're very fine, fine flour. Do you ever feel beaten, rubbed out, <laughs> hurt, sifted? An obvious lesson going on. God is sifting us. And it's interesting that they are leavened. It's the only leaven that was ever allowed in the temple er area, ever. So someday, uh, some people think that pictures us uh, because we have been sinners. But we have to be ex-sinners. We have to be sinners who... Uh, are done with that, as, at least as a way of life. I think we all still stumble, as Paul says in Romans 7. I still stumble, you still stumble. But as a way of life, we're not getting drunk as a way of life. We're not committing adultery as a way of life. We still stumble in our heads, perhaps. There's still maybe some adultery going on in our minds sometimes, men, women. Shouldn't be. But... Hopefully we're putting that beside us, uh, uh, behind us, I mean, and not being a part of that. So um, I think, though, the two leavened loaves, something very interesting about leavened bread. When you're making the bread, yeah, you put leavening into it and it spreads throughout the dough and it lifts it up. But then once it's baked and made, the leaven that's in those loaves can't leaven anything else. It's done. It's done leavening. Like Peter says, we're done with the way of life that we used to go. And our friends think it's somehow strange that we don't walk that way with them anymore. That's in one of the epistles of Peter. The same thing with these leavened loaves. The leavening is done leavening. It's not going to leaven anything else. But yeah, they were leavened loaves. But right now, because we're done with it, there's now no condemnation. None. For those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm losing my voice, so bear with me. Romans 8, verse 1. So though we still sin, Paul explains that it's not the real me anymore. It's not the, it's not the new me. It's not the Christ in me, me. It's not that part of me. Uh, it, it's that old carnal nature, as he says in Galatians 5. These war and lust against each other. So that you end up sometimes not doing the things you want to do. The end of Galatians 5, around verse 20, 21, says that. But when it's all said and done, we are told in Jude 24, I'll read from the NIV this time, Jude 24, when it's all said and done, we're going to be standing before God blameless, faultless. Remember, Christ is the one, it says that he, he takes his bride and, and he shall present the bride to himself without fault or wrinkle, without spot or wrinkle. Well, in Jude 24, it says, To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Right now, I'm with fault. But in Christ, I am not. In Christ, there's no condemnation. And unless I just completely go the other way and revert back to the old self and reject God, there should be a wonderful depiction of Jude 24, without fault and with great joy. Put that up there again, Jude 24. He's able to present us up there without fault and with great joy. 
So now we're a new lump, we're a new bread, but perhaps there's even more. How about the prodigal son? The prodigal son made a decision to go away from God, go away from his father. He finally repents when he comes to. He's sitting there in the, in the mire with the pigs. Nothing to eat. He thinks my servants are better off than this in my father's house. He decides to repent and go back. And what did our father do? The father runs out to meet him. And the father's continuing to do with us today, the same story. We're prodigals sometimes. Father was, then ordered them to put on him the best robe and sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his hand. That's all in Luke 15, verse 22. Luke 15, let's put it up there. Luke 15, verse 22. And maybe even what it says about it there. But what's the best robe? What is that picture? What is that picture? What are, what are we clothed with today? Okay, it's what we have to do. It's what we're given to clothe us. We are clothed today. Let's start, turn now to Galatians 3.27. We are clothed. It says, For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Many translations, the NASB, the NIV, and many others, the way they translate it is we have clothed ourselves with Christ and put on Christ. We have clothed ourselves with Christ. Talk about the best robe. He's our covering. He's our robe. He's our righteousness. The verses that speak of the Lord are righteousness. He's our righteousness. The sandals refer to the fact that God is restoring sonship. Restoring it. A barefoot man was a slave. When he comes back home to his father, the dad says, hey, you're not a slave anymore. You're not you're not a servant to someone else. You're my son. Someone get some good new sandals on his feet. Get a ring, the family insignia of power and authority and position. And put a brand new robe on him. So I hope you're getting it. When we have this day and the meaning of this day, we come to God as we are and we repent of that. And he washes us, pictured by the Passover pictured by the perfect life of Christ, the days of unleavened bread. He's accepted on our behalf. And then on this day, the leaven loaves are raised up to God to be accepted. And leaven loaves don't leaven anymore. They're done. And on this day, we receive the Holy Spirit. We are married to God. In the Old Testament, that's when they got married. And that's a type of what's going to happen again in the future. These things are written for examples. They're a type and a prototype, okay? So, antitype, type and antitype. God's Spirit allows Christ's righteousness to cover us. God's Spirit begets us as a child of God. God's Spirit gives us His mind. God's Spirit gives us His divine nature, kind of His DNA, if you will, His seed, His genetic code, His way of life. God's Spirit empowers us, gives us power to obey and to be like... Remember Christ said... The prince of this world is the prince of this age is coming. Uh, the ruler of this age is coming, meaning Satan. And he, he says, and I have, no, and he has nothing in me. He has nothing in me. I think that's at the end of uh, John, either 13 or 14. I quoted that before in recent sermons. His spirit intercedes with us when we pray. Uh, it gives us access to the greatest power in all the universe. It gives us access to our God, the Father. And it changes us. It emboldens us. It makes us bold and not timid anymore. Peter, Peter denied Christ three times. and He was willing to go through beatings and persecutions. And he said, I must obey God rather than man. He now proclaims Yeshua boldly after he receives the Holy Spirit. So here's the sermon I gave on 22 things the Holy Spirit does for us. Anyway, so the priest waves these two leaven loaves to heaven on Pentecost. And they're accepted. And I think this picture is God's children being raised to heaven, which I'll talk about much more next time. Why would I say that? Why have I been talking about weddings of Ruth and Boaz and the weddings of God and Israel and these loaves that are raised up, two of them? So a key thing is at the very moment that the high priest, by the way, was raising these two leaven loaves, on the day of Pentecost was also, and, and then brings his hand, hands back down, 
was also the very moment when the early church the Christians heard the strong wind and were given the Holy Spirit. So anyway, I'm basically out of time. We're going to save the rest for another sermon. I want to talk next time about uh, where will the wedding supper be of Christ and the Lamb? And when will it be? When is the first resurrection? Many of you think it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets because, you know, the last trumpet and all of that. But I'll just tell you, you know, the fall holy days is not about the first fruits. Pentecost is about the first fruits. So things that pertain to what happens to us, the first fruits, you would think would fall on Pentecost, and they do. And so we'll talk about that next time. Remember, these are dress rehearsals. And uh, be sure next year you count up to the 50th day. Don't just suddenly be there. Don't forget your Holy Day offering. And, uh, and uh, be counting the days. Uh, we're going to have a powerful, beautiful wedding soon. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful, or did have by the time you hear this, a wonderful Feast of Pentecost. Till next time, I'm just your brother, fellow servant, of our brother Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Have a wonderful Pentecost, Sabbath days, and other things you have. Father in heaven, we just thank you and we just praise you so much. We are nothing. There's so many more talented people, people who have great, greater willpower than we have. People, I don't know why you picked us. I don't know why you picked the nation of Israel. They were the least of the nations. And you didn't pick us because of anything we can bring to the table. You picked us out of your mercy and your righteousness, out of your grace. Thank you for allowing us to be first fruits. Thank you for all those who are first fruits. Thank you for you. Thank you, Yeshua, for being a perfect wave sheaf that allows the Pentecost to even happen 50 days later. Thank you for all your plans for us, Father. They're just beyond comprehension. We don't get excited enough. I'll talk about that next time more. And we should be so excited to be co-heirs of God and to be the bride of Christ. Thank you, Father. We love you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.